Amen. Good morning. Pastor Matt and his family are taking some time off to rejuvenate for the summer, and I ask that you would just remember them uh, in your prayer. So that means you have me this morning, all right? And uh, I was wondering what to talk on this morning, but I'm going to end up something that really I've been dealing with and um, some things, uh, situations of my own life. I'm going to talk a little bit about the sovereignty of God. This week... Uh, I was uh, doing my devotions, and a very familiar verse, John chapter 14, verse 27. It's the night of our Lord Jesus Christ's betrayal. Uh, he's going to have the, he has the cross uh, before him, and he's trying to speak um, really peace into the lives of uh, his disciples because they anticipated that uh, the kingdom would be established, that everything would uh, really be going their way, and all of a sudden Jesus is talking about his death. It's talking about that uh, literally the world is going to be turned upside down for them. And he says these words in verse 27 of chapter 14. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give unto you. Let your, not your hearts be troubled. Neither let it be afraid or neither let it be anxious. Now anybody beside me have trouble with anxiety. All right. I mean, um, you look at, you know, what's going on in the world and in our country. It's impossible. I was talking a little bit on Wednesday to watch the news for any length of time without getting anxious. Am I right? That the world is going to uh, end, especially when you get older. And myself, I get apprehensive for not only my kids, but my grandkids and great grandkids. Because uh, we're at this point in life that we look back and we reminisce. And I'm reminiscing about the 60s, all right? And uh, it was a different world back then. And kind of anxious about the world that our kids and grandkids are going to be uh, facing and what's going to happen. But praise God that we have the promise of our Savior that I don't have to live in anxiety uh, over what is coming all right, to this world, to this nation, what my kids are going to uh, face. I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to live in anxiety. Now, the truth is, though, I believe that, you know, being alive for a while and being a pastor for a lot of years, is that many or most believers, even though we have that promise, allow anxiety to rule in their lives. Not all Christians are walking by faith. All right? Uh, not all Christians are anxious uh, free. See, there's a difference between knowing truth and walking in that truth. Uh, most of us, we know more truth than we live out in our lives. Would you agree with that? And uh, I think it is true, you know, on this thing of anxiety and fear. Now, here's the question this morning I want to deal with a little bit. How can I... All right, live in that truth, trusting God no matter what my circumstances are. No matter if doctor asks me to sit down, I have to talk to you and reveals that we have cancer. Whether it's the news uh, that I have to go down and do a funeral of my best friend, his daughter, 30 years old, just recently died, of having a doctor say, your daughter's not going to live. Or maybe your boss calling you, I need to talk to you. We have some, uh, you know, cutbacks that we need to do. And your position is one of those cutbacks. Circumstances can change. Are you able to say this morning that you, in other words, can by faith live in those type of situations? So I want to look at that. Now, in order to trust God, in order to have peace, being anxious free, we always have to view our circumstances through the eyes of faith. You cannot view them through your physical senses. What I mean by that, it's not by what you see. It's not by, well, I feel this way. And it's not by what you understand in your mind. I have to view my circumstances, what touches my life, through faith. Now, most of us here, if you're a believer, you understand that faith of salvation, your assurance of salvation, comes through hearing the message of the gospel in the Word of God. Am I right? That faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that my assurance comes through that. 
But we also have to understand that the faith to trust God, all right, in times of uncertainty, in times of adversity, comes through what? Comes through the Word of God. If I'm going to face times of uncertainty, circumstances changing, all right, that trust is going to be founded in the message of the Word of God. It's not only through, in fact, it is only through the Word of God that I'm going to find the correct view. What is God's relationship to and his involvement in the circumstances of my life? Now, I've got to understand, how does God fit into my life? I'm talking about the everyday circumstances of my life. And it's only as I apply those scriptural truths to my heart that I'm going to have the grace to be able to trust God. Now, there's three truths, and I believe that they're going to be on the screen behind me. I'm trying to do like Matt does. I, I appreciate Matt, man. He ends up, you know, has all those great graphics, all right? I want to give you three essential truths that I have to believe in if I am going to trust God. Boom. Oh, okay. All right. See, it is there. That is good, all right? All right. I, I like, oh, man, I'm learning things. I got the screen also in front of me. I like that. All right. All right. Here's the three truths. All right, if I'm going to trust God, I've got to understand these things. Number one, I've got to understand that God is perfect in love. All right? I've got to understand that. God is perfect in love. Number two, I've got to understand that God is infinite in wisdom. All right? There's nothing beyond his understanding. And then I've got to understand that God is completely, what does it say, sovereign. All right? Now, to understand what I'm saying, all right, let me put all three of them together. It's like this. God, in his love, always wills what is best for me. Because of God's love for me as his child, his will is always for my best. All right? So God wills, out of his love, what's best for me. Now, in his infinite wisdom, he always knows what? What's best for me. See, sometimes I don't know what's best for me. You like me? Sometimes I want things in my life, and when I get them, I wish I didn't have them. You ever been like that, right? Well, God knows, all right, what's best for us. So in his love, he wills what's best, all right? In his wisdom, he knows what's best. But in his sovereignty, he has the power to bring it about, all right? He has the power to bring about what, all right, is best in my life and your life. Now, think about these three truths. Which of those truths do you suppose that we question most? I, I believe it is the sovereignty of God, all right, that God has absolute control, all right, over his creation, all right, for his glory and for the good of his people. Literally, the truth is that nothing in my life escapes the care of God or escapes the control of God. Nothing. God is completely sovereign. Now, why we question his sovereignty is because things happen in our life, we don't understand what God's doing. See, again, if you're like me, I like to be able to track God. I want to know where God's going and what he's doing. And if I know where he's going, what he's doing, then I can what? I can trust him. But if I don't know where he's going, don't know what he's doing, I have a tendency to panic and wonder if he knows what he's doing or if he is in control. Now, I might not verbalize that, but by how I live, it's really true, all right? And so I have problems if I don't understand what he's doing. He doesn't act the way I think he should act. If I lose my job, I think God should what? Pretty quickly provide me a job. Now, if that goes into weeks and months, I start quite, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is, does God know what's going on? All right. Is God in absolute control? And I'm saying the truth, we cannot escape. All right. If I'm to trust God, this is what we're dealing with, is there is nothing, all right, uh, that is outside of his control. In fact, I would say this. If there is anything, even a single event, that is outside of God's sovereign control, then you can't trust him. You cannot, all right, believe that things are outside of his divine control and yet say this morning, I can trust God. See, his love may be infinite, 
But if his power is limited to keep his purpose from being fulfilled in my life or in this world, then I really can't trust him at all times. Am I right? And I'm saying it's very important for us to understand this morning the sovereignty of God. If I am to live anxious for nothing, no matter what's going on, I mean, North Korea, they can be building the missiles. Going, they're saying they're going to shoot them over here. I mean, you got things going over in Iran. You got, I mean, there's so many hot spots in the world today. Am I right? And then what's going on politically in our own country? All right, all this stuff. All right, can be going on. I do not need to give into anxiety because God is in control. He's in control of my life. He's in control of this nation. He's in control of this world. And nothing is, all right, outside of his sovereignty and his control. Let me give you a couple of verses. Psalm 33, 11. It says, The plans of the Lord stand forever, and the purposes of his heart through all generations. That means when God makes a plan, it's it. See, when I make a plan, and you're probably the same way, I always have to adjust my plan. Am I right? We've got to tweak it. For it to get the desired results, circumstances change. God never tweaks his plan. All right? God's plan is forever uh, settled. Also in Daniel chapter 4, verse 35, it says, He, or God, does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one can hold back his hand, and no one can say to him, What have you done? In other words, no one can stop his plan from being fulfilled or his purpose to be accomplished. Now, I want to give you this morning, I'm going to give you a truth that we need to affirm in our lives. If we are to live, all right, showing forth faith, anxiety-free, no matter what's going on. See, we have a, uh, and we celebrate this morning, I'm glad you had, you know, the, those that stood up. I realized the freedoms that we enjoy today were paid by the sacrifice of those that came before us. But also, I have an obligation, I believe, in the spiritual realm as a believer, that I am to live and to stand for him and show forth a life of faith, all right, anxiety-free, fear-free, before my kids and before my family, that they understand that we have a God who is sovereign and a God who is absolutely in control. But the question, again, is, is how is this going to be done? Now, here's the truth, and I, I'm going to call it, you know, I like it, Matt, he goes, what are his truths that he says? Not a key truth, but a golden nugget. Uh, all right. Well, this is a golden nugget. All right. All right. And here's the truth. I think we have it here. All right. That is God is always at work orchestrating the events of our life to accomplish his purpose. God is always at work. All right. You ever ride down the, I mean, we're, we, we live in Fuquay, Verena. And, and they're building everywhere, right? And a lot of times you'll drive down, they have the signs up, men at work, right? But then you'll drive past and there's nobody working, all right? They just left them up for the night before. Can I say that's never true with God? God is always at work in your life, all right? He's always at work, all right? And you need to affirm that within your heart. God is at work. That means when your world looks like it's falling apart, you don't know what you're to do. God's at work, all right? God's at work in your life, orchestrating the events of your life to accomplish not your purpose, but what? His eternal purpose, which is best for you. Now, most believers claim to trust God with their eternal security, that they believe when they die, they'll go to heaven as they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him until the last day. What that means is when I get saved, I put my faith in Christ, and I believe I can trust my soul, my eternal destiny to him. But it's, it's amazing, all right? I can trust God in my soul that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But I got trouble with him today, whether he'll give me something to eat. It doesn't quite make sense, am I right? If I can trust God with my eternal soul... Can I not trust him for a job, for a meal, for clothing, for whatever my needs are? What we need to understand is that God is at work, all right, on this earth, in my life, just as he is in heaven. Now, I understand, and the Bible is very clear in this, 
God, for his own reasons, his sovereign reasons, he will allow people at times to act in defiance to his revealed will, causing you pain and suffering. Just because I'm a Christian does not mean there will not be people that will touch my life that will not cause me pain and suffering. All right? It's going to happen. Absolutely going to happen. If it was the Father's will to bruise his own son, then how in the world can I you know, sit here and end up saying, well, you know what? I should be excluded from that. God's going to allow people to do it. God also will allow circumstances to touch your life that are going to shatter your dreams. Most of us, you live long enough, you'll understand that. You'll have dreams, aspirations, plans, and then things are going to happen. Those plans are going to be shattered. Those dreams are going to seem like they're going to be, you know, vaporized. I mean, that will end up happening. It's going to cause us pain, cause us turmoil. But understand, all right, God never permits people or circumstances to overtake us that will prevent his sovereign will from being fulfilled. That means I'm going to be hurt in this world, all right? I'm going to have plans that I make never come to fruition. But in all those experiences, it'll never hinder what God's sovereign will for my life is. It would hinder my will. See, here's my battle. It's constantly Bill wants to have his way. You know what? Here, here's how I pray. God bless my plans. God bless me. God take care of what I believe I need. Where God wants me to pray for his will to be done, all right, on this earth, but even more specifically in my life, all right? It's not about God bless me, but Lord, let me come alongside you in what your sovereign will is for me uh, in this life. And understand, God will never never uh, allow people or circumstances to thwart his sovereign will. I have a couple verses here. Proverbs 19, 21. It says, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. You can have a lot of plans, right? But it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. Proverbs 21, 30. There is no wisdom. There is no insight. There is no plan that can succeed against the Lord. All right? That truth should give us comfort. That truth should help us understand, you know, no matter what happens in my life, all right, no matter what comes my way, no matter how frustrated I might get, no matter what I feel like I'm in a blind corner, don't know which way to turn, that I understand I can trust God. No matter where I find myself, I can trust him. See, no one, and I have to affirm this with my heart, no one has power against you unless permission is given by God and that permission is always aligned with the sovereign will. Nothing touches your life. That's God's will. You remember when Jesus was before Pontius Pilate? And Pontius Pilate was telling him, do you not know? I have the power to crucify you and i have the power to release you and you remember what jesus said and i believe was in a calm still voice you need to understand this you would have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from where from above need to understand that all right is that we all right are secure in the sovereign will of god no one can touch us no situation can overtake me unless God allows it. And the thing is, nothing is too small in our life to escape his attention. One of the verses I always loved is Matthew 10, 29. And a lot of people love that. In fact, I'm old enough, I remember when, what was it, Ethel Waters sang that song, all right, his eyes on the sparrow. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground, all right, apart from your Father's will. See, it's one thing to say God knows basically what's going on in my life. But I believe the Bible affirms he knows everything that's going on in your life. He knows every thought that crosses your mind. He knows every frustration of your spirit. He knows everything that touches your life. 
that causes you pain, that causes you confusion. There is nothing, nothing, no aspect of your life that escapes his attention. And nothing touches your life save he allows it. And he only allows it if his sovereign will, and I'd add this, which is best for you and best for me, all right, is accomplished uh, in that. Now, the problem is, all right, we too often allow our faith to be tied to what? Our physical senses, don't we? In other words, I got great faith as long as I can see what God's doing, as long as I can feel, right? I don't know how many times, Pastor. I, I know what the Bible says, Pastor. I know what you say, but you understand, I feel this, right? We try to understand God by understanding. We try in our you know, finite minds. I want to understand what God's doing. I want to be able to track him to make sure everything works out uh, right, all right? And we got this idea, my life is out of control unless I understand what God is doing. I need to have my faith not based on my senses, but my faith based on what? The truth of the Word of God. Because uh, I kid around, how I feel changes all the time. Anybody like me? Anybody like you get, I was kidding Wednesday night, you ever get up and both sides of the bed are the wrong side? I mean, I, I, I sometimes I get up and I'm not a nice person. I don't know what happened tonight. All right? It's like Diane will, will tell me, what's wrong with you? I don't know, but it's like, it's better stay away from me, right? I mean, my, and so if I base my faith on my feelings, oh, man, I'm, I'm in trouble, right? I need to base it upon God's truth, that God is always at work in his creation. Whatever he allows to touch my life, he, uh, again, is going to give me the grace to endure, all right, and it is best for me. See, I happen to believe this. My God, my Savior, knows my circumstances better than I know. In fact, I don't want to know everything that's going on. If, we, if you knew everything that was going on hovering around that might touch your life, it would give us a nervous breakdown, all right? Understand Jesus knows the circumstances perfectly. And your aim in life, all right, or what you'd be most concerned about is not the circumstances of life. See, most times we make life about, I want to control everything that touches me. And I understand this one, all right, because I'm a control person. I want to control my wife. I want to control my kids. I want to control my job. I want to control it all. And then I feel secure. That is not to be the center part of your life. You know what the center part of your life? Your relationship to God. He's in control of your circumstances. You don't even know everything that's hovering out there. But I'm going to make my relationship to him the central part of my life so I can understand he's in control. I'm not in control, and that's okay. He's in control. He has the responsibility. Again, I've lived long enough. I understand this. And what am I saying? Being in control is not all it's cracked up to be. When I was a young man, wanted to succeed, wanted to be the man. All right? Be in control, responsible for it all. As you get older, I don't believe, I, I would tell people at church, you know, your pastor, church, I just want to put cans on the shelf at Walmart. And nobody's saying, nothing wrong with working at Walmart. But you know what I, mean? I, I don't want no response. Just tell me where to put them on, and I'm willing to do it, all right? I don't want responsibility. You know, it's a wonderful truth that God's in control. I can trust him. I don't have to be in control. It's not about Bill's idea of how things should be, but I abandon myself to God as he works out his goodwill according to his good pleasure. And in the end, I'm going to be glad he did. Now, here's what I want to do this morning. I want you to turn to the book of Esther. The book of Esther is right before the book of Job. All right, so if you find the book of Job, you'll find the book of Esther. I want you to see what I'm talking about lived out uh, in this uh, book, all right? Uh, and in fact, I thought it was kind of interesting. I was flipping channels was yesterday, and um, on one of the channels, religious channels, I tuned into a Jewish rabbi, and he was talking on Esther, and I thought it was very interesting. 
And basically the same thing, all right? Even from uh, the perspective of Judaism, God is in sovereign, complete control, and shown by the book of Esther. book of Esther is a beautiful book. I cannot go entirely through the book of Esther. Hopefully you know the story, what the background of that book is, is that the Jews are in captivity. They had disobeyed God, lived without, or had recognized his authority over them. God has put them into captivity, first under the Babylonians, then the Medes and Persians have defeated the Babylonians, and they find themselves under captivity or under the authority, all right, of the Persian uh, Empire. And what I'm going to do, we're going to look at a couple of verses out of this book, and I'm going to show you three realities, all right, concerning this truth that God's in control, my life and your life, all right, always at work, that you see in the book of Esther that are true, all right, in our lives, all right? Here's the three realities. This, I, I got to constantly affirm this to myself. Reality number one, God is at work in the small, everyday details of my life, all right? No matter how painful, mundane, or confusing they are. See, we want to think that God's only at work at the big things, right? The big moments. Can I say this? Life is made up of the small moments. The small events in our life. That one of the things that I learned as I got older, and that if you're young and you have children, you don't want to miss the small events. It's the small things in life that bring great pleasure and great blessing. And I'm saying God is in control, all right? of the mundane events, even though they'd be confusing to what is going on. The background, as I said, Israel is in captivity in Persia. All right, they've been there for many, many years. The king now of Persia is a Hasteris, all right, and he's throwing a big party. And in fact, during this party, remember the book of Esther, he wants to bring in his wife, all right, and parade her beauty among all of his drunken guests. And his wife commits the unpardonable sin of saying, no, I'm not going in, all right? And uh, ends up cause confusion in the whole empire. You think about this, all right? Because all his officials are saying, whoa, if his wife said no, then my wife can say what? We got to nip this in the bud, all right? <laughs> and uh, so they end up that the queen's going to be expelled, but they have to find a way that can, you know, the king's in depression and everything else. And this is when you pick this up. It says, after this one, the wrath, I'm going to start in chapter 2, verse 1. The wrath of King Asterisk subsided from being mad over his wife not coming in. He remembered Vashti as his wife. In other words, basically what happened, he got all upset emotional. Ah, you're going to be queen no more. That's the end of it. And then, oh, what did I do? I love her. <laughs> She's my wife, all right? And he remembers her, all right? And uh, when what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, well, we got this idea. We're going to let beautiful young virgins be brought before the king and let the king appoint officers and all the provinces of his kingdom. And by the way, the Persian Empire was all the way from India to what we know as Libya. I mean, you're talking vast empire, right? So we're going to have a beauty contest, basically, you know, Miss Universe, or at least that their universe. And we're going to bring them all in be, uh, before you to the woman's quarters under the custody of a guy, the king's unit, custody, uh, custodian of the woman, and let beauty preparations be given to them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Ashtai. Now you, uh, you can imagine this plan before a pagan king. We're going to bring the most beautiful women from the entire world before you, and you can choose anybody you want. What do you think the king said? Sounds like a good idea to me, right? And uh, so this is what's going to happen. Now, in Sushan, the citadel, this is the capital, there was a certain Jew, very unique statement in Hebrew. Just so happened at this exact time, there was a particular man, a certain Jew, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamin. He's a Jew that's been in captivity since his great grandfather was taken there. It says Kish had been carried from Jerusalem with the, cap uh, with the captives captured by Jehonah and the king of Judah, 
whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carried away. And Mordecai brought up Hadasha, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. It uh, says, the young woman was lovely, beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So what ended up happening, this young girl by the name of Esther, mom and dad died, all right? Tragic event. And then you have the uncle, he's going to end up raise her. So it says, when the king's command Cree was heard, and when many young women were gathered at the citadel under the custody of a guy, Esther was taken into the king's palace in care of a guy, the custodian of the woman. Now, think about this for a second, all right? Sometimes we just read this story without thinking. Esther was an orphan, am I right? Both her parents died, mom and dad. Would you call that a negative event in your life? I would call it a negative event, am I right? Something tragic happened. She lost both of her parents. From this negative experience, all right, she's going to be raised where? In the capital, under the care of her uncle Mordecai, who just happened to work in the capital, all right? He was assigned there. And in fact, even in the Pacific place, you'll end up seeing. Esther just happened to be what? Beautiful. Understand this. How you look is no accident. God determines that even for his eternal will. Esther, just at this time, she happened to be a beautiful young lady. She happened to be at the age she was just when this decree went out. And she happened to be single. She wasn't married. This is all by accident, all right? That, and she just happened to be single there. Now, living in the capital, her beauty is going to be noticed. And eventually, all right, if you read the book of Esther, she's going to be chosen to be who? To be the queen. And if chapter 2, verse 17, it says this, The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight, more than all the other virgins, so she set, so he set the royal crown on her head. She was made queen instead of Vashti. A Jew was put on the throne as queen. Now understand from that position, she was going to be instrumental in sparing her people from destruction and eventually secure their position to return. See, God's, this, she has negative upon negative in her life. All right, man, you're, you're, you're an orphan. I mean, you're taken from your home. You're going to end up, uh, all these things happen, all right? But God's going to use that for his ultimate end. Then you consider Mordecai, her uncle. He was living in Persia. Was that his choice? Did he get up one day? You know, sometimes we'll do this. I, I think I want to move to Persia. No, he, he, there was no choice. Uh, they, literally, he was born in captivity, all right? Uh, the Jews were taken captive by the Babylonians. They destroyed Jerusalem. He wasn't there by choice, all right? He was there because his great-grandfather was taken captive. From this negative, he was serving in the palace. He, wasn't, he didn't answer a help wanted ad. You understand, right? He didn't have a, a, you know, a vocational counselor. Where should you serve? You serve here. He was put in a certain position there at the court. And from that place, Esther will be raised. She would become queen, but also God's going to have Mordecai in the exact position that he needed to be to discover a plot, all right, by two of the king's subordinates to kill the king. He was sitting in the place that God had him to be. And in chapter 2, verse 21, it says, In those days... By Mordecai sat at the king's gate, his responsibility, two of the king's eunuchs, all right, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on the king. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name, all right? And uh, this is later going to be used to spare, all right, God's people from destruction. But I want, I want you to see, and I wish I had more time to deal with this, is there are so many negative details in Esther's life and Mordecai's life. They're in places they would never have chose to be. 
Their, their lives are what you would look at, and I would look at tragedy upon tragedy. But God was in control, weaving like a tapestry their lives to bring them to the point, all right, that he would use them to accomplish his sovereign will, that Israel would not only be spared from destruction, but that literally she was probably the queen on the throne when the decree went out that Israel would be able to return to the land. Now, what I want to say is this. That's true in your life and my life. You can have negative upon negative. It can, I mean, it can be death. It can be situations literally you feel you have no control, that your circumstances literally are moving you to a place you would never choose of your own. But I am saying because of God's sovereignty, nothing touches you save he allows it. He is in control of every detail of your life, no matter how mundane, no matter how confusing, and you can trust him. You can trust him. I need to understand that. We need to understand that in the times that we live. Because as you look at this world, I mean, it's literally, it seems like it's out of control. But it is in his control. Let me give you the second reality. You know what the second reality is? You will not always see God in the midst of your situation. You know, we, I said I like to track God. We want to, you know, I can trust God if I can sort of just get an idea of what he's doing. Read the book of Esther. Whose name is never written in the book of Esther? God's name. You never find God's name in the book of Esther, but yet God is throughout the book of Esther. Sometimes you might not be able to trace God in your situation, but I'm saying that God is always there. One of the interesting factors, like I said, in the book of Esther, the name of God is never mentioned, but yet when you read the story, you see God in every situation. All right? Now, I read the book of Esther, and I can see God in it, all right, I, I, in Esther's life and Mordecai's life. But understand, Mordecai and Esther couldn't see it. They didn't know what was going on. This is true in your life and in my life. Many of the situations I have lived through and you'll live through, you're not going to see God. You're going, where is he? What is he doing? But just because I cannot see God in my situation does not mean that God is not there. All right? He is there. If you know the story of Esther, let me read a couple other verses quickly. Mordecai, the uncle, all right, devout Jew, he has offended a man by the name of Haman. Haman is the chief advisor to the king. Haman's a snake, all right? And what he does, he gets the king to pass a law. All right, that on the last month of the year, on a certain day, all the Jews of the kingdom will be killed. All right, see, Mordecai has offended Haman, and Haman is so furious, he not only wants really Mordecai dead, let's wipe out all the Jews. I mean, I mean, he's a Jew, we're getting rid of them all. All right, and he ended up promising the king, I'll put a certain amount of money in your treasury if you'll pass that law. King, I'll get richer, I'll make money on this. And all the Jews are going to be destroyed. And so this is what happens. And word goes out that on a certain day, all the Jews are going to be destroyed. How it's going to happen is they're going to give authority to all the neighbors. Think about this, all right, if you were a Jew. All your neighbors are going to be able to come, kill you, your family, take everything you belong. Think about how this would operate, right, in your home and everything. You'd be able to come, take your house, take all your furniture, take everything, kill everybody. This is what's going to happen in the kingdom, all right? And the word goes out. This is in chapter 4 when Mordecai goes to, has a message sent to Queen Esther. Because Esther, remember, is queen. And nobody knows she's a Jew. So what's Esther probably want to do? Just shut up and just ride it out, all right? Nobody knows. They'll all die and I'll be alive, all right? And Mordecai says, all right, to Queen Esther... Don't think in your heart you're going to escape in the king's palace any more than the rest of the Jews. Because if you remain silent in this time, deliverance will arise uh, for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether, you see, and even he understand, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time like this. 
Who knows whether God has orchestrated your entire life, Esther, for this very moment. And even though it is one scary time, maybe that is exactly where God has placed you for that moment. It says, Then Esther told and replied to Mordecai, Gather all the Jews who are present at Shushan, fast for me, neither eat or drink three days, three nights. And she goes on and says that I will go into the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Literally what the law was, if you understand this, is that the king on his throne, you could not just walk into his audience. He had a scepter, and if I came into his court, all right, and he did not extend his scepter to me to accept my presence, I literally would forfeit my life. And Esther hasn't been called into his presence in a while. And he's saying, you need to go and take care of this. But if I walk in and he doesn't accept my presence, it means my death. But she's willing to what? She's willing to go in, put her life on the line. I perish, I perish. But what I want you to understand is that, that when you look at this whole situation, they don't understand what's going on. They don't see God. They can't track God. And I'm saying in your life and in my life, there's going to be circumstances you're not going to see God. You're not going to be able to track God. He's going to feel like a million miles away. You don't understand what is going on, but yet you turn by the grace of God, I'm going to trust him, I'm going to do what's right. That's what she did. Because we have a God who's sovereign. God's in control. Did it look like he was in control? No, it didn't look like I mean, they're all going to be killed. But God's in you think God was in heaven? Oh, I wonder how this is going to work out. I hope he's, he's not in heaven wringing his hands. He knows exactly the end of the story. We're the ones that wring our hands, right? Because we want God to act how we want and when we want. That gives me to the third reality. Is God is the great orchestrator of all events, good and bad, to bring about his sovereign will. We quote the verse a lot, all right? All things what? Work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. But do we actually believe it? You know what's interesting in this story? All right. Remember I told you Haman is going to have Mordecai killed. Very interesting what happens. Haman is so anxious he wants to hang Mordecai. He builds the gallows in his backyard. Now imagine this, right? I mean, he wants to hang his guy. And he ends up in his mind tomorrow morning. I'm going to go in before the king, and I'm going to make the request. And, uh, let, let, me, let me just kill Mordecai ahead of time. You know, just, just let me have one life, and we're going to hang him with the gallows I already made. That night, while Haman is sleeping, waiting, all right, to go the next morning in to see the king, notice chapter 6, what happens. I only could read some of these verses. It says that night, the king couldn't sleep. So one was commanded, so one commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they are read before the king. You, you know what this is like? They, they kept a chronicle, everything went on in the kingdom. It'd be like, I can't sleep. Will you bring, bring me the history of the world and just read it? Start. <laughs> you know, right, wherever you want to start, just read it, and I'll end up falling asleep. That was happened, all right? And it was found written, just happened to turn to the place nobody knew, written the place that Mordecai had told of the two eunuchs, the doorkeepers, who were going to assassinate the king. Then the king said, whoa, I didn't know that. I forgot that. What honor has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him says nothing has been done for Mordecai. So the king said, who's in the court? Now it's morning. All right. Haman entered the outer court. He's entered the outer court to do what? Let me kill Mordecai, all right? The king just had read that night on the Chronicles that Mordecai is the one who saved his life. Haman comes in, all right? And the, king's, and the king ends up saying to Haman, all right? He says, what shall be done for the man who the king delights in? Haman immediately thinks who? Who, who does he delight in more than me, right? And it ends up the, that Haman thought in his heart, all right, that's me. And he answered, this is what you should do. Let a royal robe be brought before him, a robe that the king has worn and a horse on which the king has ridden, a royal crest on its head. Let the robe and the horse be delivered to the hand of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. 
Then parade him on horseback throughout the city and proclaim before him, this shall be done to the man who delights the king. And the story is the king goes, man, great. Haman, get Mordecai over there. You put him on the horse and you lead him throughout all the town. Mordecai's the one he wanted to hang. Now he's leading him by horse throughout the town, honoring him. All of a sudden, Haman realizes, I'm in big, what? Trouble, <laughs> all right? And uh, by the time you come to the end of that chapter, all right, it ends up says that Haman was hung on the gallows that he had built for Mordecai. And the Jews still celebrate this uh, holiday to this day. Here's my questions. Why couldn't the king sleep that night? Who kept him up? It was God, evidently, right? I mean, that's kind of a small detail. Why did the king ask for the chronicles to be read? There were times he would have music played. Why that night did he want the book of the chronicles read? Why not through the music? Why did the reader just happen to turn to that section, right, that was talking about Mordecai? And remember, this was at the exact moment right before Haman is going to be coming in. And why did Haman appear that exact moment, all right, to hang Mordecai? The obvious answer was what? It's like just like you play chess. Is God's moving the pieces? Checkmate. My will is accomplished. And I'm saying that I need to understand God's a great orchestra. Sure, this is not good in my life. All right, not everything touches your life is good. But God is able to orchestrate it all out for his perfect sovereign will, which ultimately will be for my good. Does God orchestrate the events of life for good? Yes, he does. Is he at work in his time and his purpose? Yes. And many times you live long enough, you understand this. He usually shows up right before. I mean, we call it the last moment, but he calls it the exact moment. And rest assured, that's going to be true in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Romans 8.28 is true, all right? It says, and we know that all things work together for good. That's in my life, that's in your life. To those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. And what I would say this morning, what in your life causes you to be anxious about? Let's be honest. There are things that cause us to be anxious. Whether in our country, whether in our world, what's going on in our life, Determined to be like Esther, all right? I'm going to trust God no matter what the circumstances are. And I understand that God is always at work. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed for a second. Let me ask this this morning. I know Matt always has a time that Abel come to the altar. Maybe you're here this morning, and you're in a situation that really is causing you anxiety causing you fear. You don't know how it's going to end up. You don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Maybe this morning you need to bow before him, and just as Queen Esther did, that you just need to trust him. You don't need to know what the outcome is going to be. You're going to trust him that the outcome is going to be according to his sovereign will. Maybe you need to lay at his feet, understand my God's at work, in every detail of my life, he loves me. In his wisdom, he knows what's best for me. And in his power and sovereignty, he's bringing it about. And I'm going to choose in my situation to trust him. Maybe that's what you need to do this morning. As they do an invitation hymn, I'm going to ask for you to stand this morning. Everyone standing will be closed in just a second. But maybe you need to step out and just by faith as you bow at this altar. Just put that situation before him and say, I'm, I'm going to trust you. If I perish, I perish. But I know whether in life or in death, I can trust you. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that your will may be done and that we, dear Lord, would understand not only that you love us, not only that you have all wisdom, but that you have all power to bring about your will and you are conscious of every detail, every circumstance in our life. For we pray this in Jesus' name.